Hey everyone, I'm Mike Henry, and this is my Procreate demo for the piece I call Amber. Now, the name of this piece is of course not her name, but the color of her eyes. When I first started this piece, I wanted to do something that was honestly just playing with symmetry at the beginning, which is something that I sort of go to every now and then because I think it can create like a fun little image. Uh, if you go back a ways, there's like the, the Rita piece and the the chick that, with all the black tattoos and like it's similar concept here. Um, I just wanted to like do a new one basically. Uh, you know, when we're doing pieces, there, you need to do like the pieces that are for you and then the pieces that have a purpose. And the pieces that have a purpose, there were a lot recently with the monster ones where even though they're for me, there was like goals associated. It was almost like client work in the sense that I had created parameters and I had to keep delivering against them. For this one, it was more about just, I want to relax and just draw something that's compelling to me. So that's how this whole thing started. Now I have this extra slow down in the beginning because the lines were actually super fast. A lot of people ask me when when do I know that I have the lines where I need them to be in order to move into coloring? And I always say that it's just about information. How much information do you need to do what you need to do? And that means that if you are usually passing it to somebody else who's not used to your work, you probably need to do lots of detail. Or if you're really unsure because you're doing like a car engine and you've never had to draw a car engine before, which by the way would be my personal nightmare, um, then you need lots of detail and lots of definition. For this, because it is basically just a woman's standing there, I'm familiar with anatomy, I'm familiar with how to paint something like this, especially using the symmetry tool, uh, so I didn't really need that much more. There was enough information there to not only tell me that I was going to be excited to do it, but that I was also going to have enough information to finish the job. So at this point, I did not know that she was going to have any piercings, and I did not know that she was going to have any tattoos. I just kind of wanted to draw this woman, and that's how this started. Um, then, as time goes on, I wanted to find some things that would add more interest. Now, you also see that there's a big orange background here. At one point, I wanted it to actually be a rainbow background, and you're going to see that come in. There's I use the same streaky shape that's in the final image, but it's a rainbow. Then I start saying to myself, maybe I should get this more under control and a little bit more opinionated so that it's one strong color. I think it could have worked either way, but that's the way I end up going. And at some point you see me making it um, like purple and then I pull it over to pink. Obviously pink is my favorite color and I'm inclined to do that, but in this case I just thought that it worked and it pulled everything in a more interesting place. Now you see here that her eyes or are blue. Um, for people of African descent, blue eyes are super, super rare. And I'm always concerned about doing something like that because sometimes it can seem like all you're doing is making the eyes blue in order to make it interesting. But I needed something in this piece just in general that I thought would be the focal point for the piece. And so we end up moving away from the blue eyes and going to amber eyes. And that's because I start thinking about pulling it more to like a brown, but then I wanna kind of like lighten it and bring some intensity into the stare and so that's where we end up going with more of like an amber color of course we also decide to bring in some other things that kind of fleshes this character out more like the tattoos and the piercings and all that kind of stuff um, speaking of that the piercings end up the reason why they're white is because I really liked the way that looked when I did the crystal character not that long ago from the monster series and so I thought it'd be kind of cool to just have these almost self illuminated just very bright white piercings um, because I think that looked cool all the time so I just kind of wanted to bring that in instead of metal which I've done like a million times so in the interest of mixing it up for my own uh, benefit and keeping the illustration interesting to me that's what we end up going with speaking of the tattoos uh, I've mentioned this before when you do somebody who is heavily tattooed and you're not just kind of filling them with almost more like graphic shapes you're actually trying to give them tattoos that look like they got them from somewhere um, and that they had like a meaning to that person it's like doing two illustrations at the same time when I did Rolf for the Monster series, that one was pretty elaborate because he has four arms and you see a lot of his body. With something like this where we're just kind of doing a like waist up or like a rib cage up, it's basically a bust, you can, there's just a little bit more energy that you can spend because you're taking on less in other areas. So I thought that it would be a really good opportunity. We've done this before, like I said, in the piece that is called Marked, and then I did Marked Revisited. It was originally a line drawing, and then I later rendered it. And in here, it's a similar concept where it's like, let's go with this solitary figure and let's give her some character across the board, right? 
You can see here that originally the piercing was gold. I was gonna go with like a bright yellow, not actually a gold, but like a bright self-illuminated yellow. But then I decided to go white because here I thought it worked really nicely because we had this orange background, but eventually when I start moving everything to more of like a white with, a br with bright colors in the background, I thought it'd be cool to bring that to white as well. So we're still in the flats process here, but I am bringing in skin tone variations at this stage since I have the lines that can inform me mostly where everything is going to be. So we're going to go ahead and use those lines to support those decisions, but they can get altered as the shadowing process begins. So you can see some variations in her breasts and in her face and in her neck and certain other areas. That's all just from reference, by the way. When you're making uh, any type of piece of art that's like stylized, it doesn't have to be stylized, but in this case, let's talk stylization. You have certain amounts that you are making up and creating from scratch because that is where the stylization, the stylization is kind of coming from. You're referencing something that's real, but you're making decisions that pulls it away from reality. But then the things that you are keeping closer to reality, you should do your best to reference still, even if you're not doing something that's some hyper-realistic thing. Because stylization is really like the decision decisions you're making around what you're going to keep that is accurate to real life and what you're not going to keep. So for instance, something like Looney Tunes, you're keeping, you are still keeping things that are in real life, right? Like somebody like Elmer Fudd has two eyes and a nose and ears and we know the general shape of like a human head and the general, the count of uh, how many arms, how many legs, but then you make decisions like maybe I'll draw one less finger because that'll be cheaper to animate or maybe um, the all the colors will be flat because they have to be animated or maybe the eyes will be bigger because they have to emo. That's an example of stylization that's pretty extreme. You've got something like what I'm doing here where you're taking on more realism but it's certainly not realistic, right? And that's really that ratio that you're looking for when you're doing the stylization. The trick though is that whenever you are making a decision to not reference real life, you have to have an answer for how you're going to reconcile that. Both how you're going to reconcile some stylistic element into another stylistic element, but then also how you're going to reconcile the aspects of your art that is more real with the aspects that are more stylized. And so that's where we are here with the skin tone. This is something that I've talked about before, which is that I am playing with some shapes and some colors and some lighting and all that kind of stuff that's stylized. So, but one thing that I push more realistically is something like skin tone variation or the way like hair is rendered or the way the lighting hits. I try to find this ratio that I enjoy between the stylistic angles of that as well as the realistic. Now let's talk about the techniques we're using here. We are using the symmetry tool to do the painting on this. Uh, it's not going to be done all the time though. We're gonna to toggle it on and off in order to take into account the aspects that aren't symmetrical. Obviously her body, her core body and face is symmetrical, except you'll notice her one eyebrow is raised a little bit, um, but her hair is not. So wherever, and her piercing, no sorry, her piercings are also all symmetrical as well. So those are the things that we're going to be able to embrace the symmetry tool on but then we're gonna to have to turn that off, toggle it off for the parts that are basically related to her hair, anywhere that we're painting her hair or anywhere that we're painting the shadows from her hair. Now, why does part of her hair look gray right now? That's just because when you're dealing with super dark colors um, that are all overlapping or super light colors, actually, it's not really even about lightness or darkness in this case because uh, it's not about the background. It's just strictly about the colors that are overlapping that are the same. And I want to make sure that I'm keeping those super separate here. So for instance, in order for me to clearly see that I'm painting the hair that is behind some of the other hair layers, I need to lower that opacity, bring some of that white background in, and then that way I can tell them apart and separate them. And then I can start painting. And then I, at the end, I can turn it all into full opacity and it'll all look really good together. But for my own eye to be able to sort out all of the shapes, that's what I need to do when I'm in the middle of it. By the way, when we get to the tattoo phase, um, I will try to zoom in on all of those and we can talk about kind of like what goes into each one of those and why, uh, like how elaborate they actually are. So right now we're working on the hair. I think you can start sort of seeing in the fact that I've got that back hair turned off and then I've got like this mid hair 
at 50% opacity and then I've got the front hair, you can kind of see how that's all broken up. Now something that's interesting is if you look at those, that sort of like main dread that's kind of coming down over her eyebrow, you'll see that it's almost like two and then kind of halfway down one of the dreads ends. That's because I end up making that dread fade into the other one once all is kind of like said and done and brought together in the end. But I needed to separate those for other reasons and that's why they are like that. Now. As you know, if you follow this channel for a while, all of these shadows are on the same layer. And in doing that, that means that I can keep all of this really separate and I can go through it in that way. But then at the end, when I uh, need to make that transition into the other one, since I'm all just working on one layer, I can just do that. And I don't have to worry about selections or any kind of craziness like that. I'm zo I've zoomed here uh, on the face so that we can see just kind of how the face construction works. Uh, let's start reviewing some of the methods here. So if you're new to the channel, what I usually do when I'm working in Procreate in order to conserve layers is all of my shadow layers get co-located on just a few layers as opposed to them being kind of like a layer for each part of the body or something like that. And I also, on the opposite side of things, instead of being like super... Uh, not not like so many layers, but also on the side of so few layers. I don't paint things all on one layer I mean, that's kind of the purpose of some of these digital tools is that you can separate things out and you can use them how you want to in order to accomplish your goals so the way this works is I do what's called sort of like a form shadow pass, which is where I'm going in and there's going to be a little bit of ambient occlusion happening and a little bit of me just kind of sculpting the character's uh, features wherever they be, um, as well as like if it's a, a vehicle or whatever, whatever it is, I'm doing that to kind of define some of those shapes. And that's what you see here. It's done with a multiply layer. And in this case, you can kind of see the color on those dreads in the back that aren't turned on because they're over white. That's kind of the color that I'm using here. So it's a little bit smeared out so you can't exactly see it. You just saw it flip to normal there for a second and that was more accurate to the color. But anyways, the point is it's a pale brown red kind of. Um, and that color is set to multiply because multiply always darkens. So uh, I've covered that in the past. I'm not going to go into a detail thing here, but just the simplest way is multiply always darkens, which means if you're using white, it won't darken at all. If you're using black, it darkens 100%. Um, if you search my channel for like, I think multiply breakdown or something like that, I do talk about it a little bit more in depth. But that's what we're using here. So then I'm also going to employ some other shadow layers using the same color set to multiply on a new layer that's going to be either like support shadows to define certain areas, like maybe the underside of the nose where I just want to punch up some darkness or like the upper lip where I want to punch up some darkness. But then we'll also use a cast shadow pass, which is what you're seeing kind of go in. I think that's what's going to be going in right now. No, it looks like I'm still doing ambient occlusion or form shadow right now. Um, so that's what that's what's happening there. And so what we're looking for, the philosophy that we're looking for is we're trying to sort of like separate out the stages of how we're lighting this character. We're giving her almost like her diffuse map, um, if you want to sort of think of it in 3D terms. And then we're using like the cast lighting. And then from there, we're also going to kind of like define almost like a specular map sort of um, by putting on then the lighting layers. So all of it is technically lighting, but that's the terms I usually use is like shadow for the things that are darkening and lighting for the things that are lightening. Um, and we're going to be using like a pale blue. I've over the years shifted kind of, not 100% of the time, but a lot of the time from using an overlay setting or something like that for my lighting and more to just using a normal uh, layer and then lowering its opacity because I kind of like the slight matteness that it provides and it also allows you to kind of have the light sitting on top and that's going to come in really big because this character has tattoos. The reason why that comes in, I've, I've explained this before, but since this character is so heavily tattooed, I think I should talk about it, is the light dances across the top of a tattoo. If you have a tattoo or if you've seen anybody with a tattoo or you want to look up some reference, because reference is always good to look up, um, you'll notice that when light hits the skin at an angle and it creates a sheen, you basically can't see the tattoo at all. That's kind of like what we're trying to capture here is the idea of the light sitting on top because that's kind of what it does. Light does permeate and it does get under the skin, uh, but on that sort of like glancing lighting kind of level, it it just does that. It sheens across the top. Now, if we want the light like behind the figure and we want to get some subsurface scattering involved, then then we do that. And it's a different it's a different beast. And we're talking about it entering the skin at a different angle and producing a slightly different result. So when you have that lighting layer set to a normal, 
it will sit on top as opposed to something like a overlay which will alter the contrast of everything it'll honor the blacks a little bit more so if you have black tattoos it'll keep them black and then if you have like for instance her skin which is brown it will lighten the brown and then you have a high contrast between the skin and the tattoo and what we're really looking for is for that light to knock back that tattoo a little sit on top of the tattoo and then that'll make it look a little bit more realistic I'll talk a little bit more about the tattoos when we get there. I've, I've really broken that down in the past, so we won't go crazy deep here, but I'll try to talk about some of those um, principles just a little bit quickly like I just did when we actually get to that. As somebody who is uh, fairly tattooed, I usually have an opinion on how they're represented, and I think the tattoos can be represented in a very stylistic way or in a very realistic way, but then I feel like there is sort of a more of a... There is a wrong way, though, which is kind of funny, right? Like, if you, for instance, make something too overly precise and it's not in a fantastical setting, um, like if you were to, say, take just like a photo, like a super clean drawing, and then you just stick it on the character and set it to multiply or something like that, that's not good enough because it's going to have aspects of it that aren't going to feel like a tattoo. And that's actually some of the problems I have sometimes when people do kind of like too too blocky, big, symbolic -y. that's a bad word for it, but, like, for instance, if you're gonna have a character that just has, like, a big blue swirl tattoo, like, that's really, like, just kind of unrealistic, and it usually starts looking more like paint. There's ways to make it look more like a tattoo, but that's a very stylized way to do a tattoo. Similar to kind of, like, I guess you could say, like, the way, like, Aang from Last Airbender has, uh, his tattoos they kind of like are these like almost like they're like paint they're not like a tattoo kind of so yeah anyways we'll we'll come to that when we get to that stage and i'll zoom in and try to really talk about that just blew through a couple of phases a little bit quickly i sped it up just a bit so that we could get to the lighting which is what we're at now a second ago, I you saw like a couple of blue strokes just go across the, the figure because I was just trying to see the way the paint was going to play across a couple of different colors. And once I got the one that I liked, I decided to say, yeah, okay, cool, that's the right opacity. Now, it's pretty easy for me to ballpark it at this point, but it never hurts to check, and that's, that's what I did there. So you can see here, by the way that the paint's laying down, that I'm still using the... Uh, symmetry tool here because it's I mean why wouldn't I write this character is mostly symmetrical and then just like with the shadows we're gonna find some opportunities to turn it off and use uh, just paint it in where we need to or or um, like for instance where the eyebrow is now where the hair is we don't really need to take that into account because this light is coming in and it would be blocked by whatever is casting a shadow the light wouldn't hit that area so something that we do one of the things that's nice about keeping all of the layers separate is we can actually be slightly reckless with the way we're laying down the light we still are trying to honor all of the forms and make sure that we're doing a good job of uh of communicating that but if we paint into the shadow um, because we're maybe just being like a little bit looser, it actually doesn't matter because then what we do is we just select that shadow layer when all is said and done and clear it from the lighting layer, which is really nice and handy. Now we don't do that really from the uh, form shadow and that's because the form shadow is a little bit more ambiguous and it can be really soft in places and if I'm putting down light usually that's getting, that's kind of like intermingling with the form shadow, I it's probably something I want to happen. And so I don't want to have like an area where I've decided to overlap that a bit and then an area where I want to clear it. And then when I do like a universal clear like that, it takes it away from the part where I want it. So we try to avoid that in its entirety. We only use that hard cast shadow to clear away the lighting. We're going to, uh, but but now you ask, what about the lighting that's like a bounce lighting that could that could get in there? Well, I wouldn't be using this color. We're going to be doing a bounce lighting pass at some point in this piece, and that's where we'll get that extra bounce from. Okay, so now we're moving into the tattoo time. So I'm gonna make sure this is a little slowed down. First, we're gonna keep it pulled out like this so that you can just sort of see the composition of all the tattoos. So you can see that I went with some symmetry. We've got the skull symmetrical. Right now those roses are symmetrical but we'll change that. We've got the coffin that's symmetrical and then we've got this swallow on her chest with the eye on it that is symmetrical. But then we're not going to make 
the arms symmetrical because that's, I mean, you can do that. You could absolutely decide to do that. It's just more unrealistic. So, oh, here I had to adjust the flowers and I did it and then I decided to make it a little asymmetrical already and we'll get into to the more details on that in a second. The thing that I'm always looking for in character design is making sure I'm at least telling some sort of a story, even if it's really small. You can tell a story in expression, you can tell a story in lots of ways, you can tell a story in the clothes somebody's wearing, you can tell a story in the item that they're holding in their hand. There's lots of ways you can do it. This character being naked, of course, she doesn't have clothes on, she's got a lot of decisions though she's made to define herself. The way she styles her hair, the fact that she's got the piercings, the way she's put on her makeup, the way she has placed her tattoos. And so tattoos, of course, their nature generally is about telling a story. Uh, so that is something that we want to make sure that we're communicating here. The style of tattoo that somebody chooses to get, the subject matter, all of these things are very, very important for communicating the person. And I think that if you really take your time and you go through all these tattoos and you kind of look at what they all are, what they could be implying, there's maybe an interesting character here. Now we're going to jump around a lot because I wanted to try and capture everything. You saw some test strokes there. That's me trying to figure out what really is going to be the best way to try and capture the look of a tattoo in this stylized illustration. So I'm just testing a bunch of stuff right here and then I eventually find the one that I like and I'm going to go with it. Now, as with everything else with this illustration, anything that is symmetrical, we will be using the symmetrical tool for in order to save us on 50% of the work, right? And we're going to go through and do um, everything similarly but not exactly to the way a tattoo artist would in the sense that we're going to go through and just line everything and then we're going to go through and shade it the only difference is, is because of the nature of uh digital art we will do like fills if it's like solid black so really my goal here is to do lines and solid blacks because that's the style of tattoo that i want this uh character to have and so we're going to go through and we're going to do all of that and then come back through and we're going to use the bonobo I've, I've said this before i don't know how to say that word bonobo bonobo i don't know but it's that brush uh, i think it's in the sketch section i can't remember and it's sort of like a noise brush that's really similar to what it is and it kind of replicates the pepper shading so we go with that um and you'll see that come in when we get to that stage so right now we're, we're doing some adjustments we're trying to make sure everything is looking good taking up the right sort of like space on the canvas and then with the shoulder what you can see here i quickly turned on not the symmetry tool but the well it's still i guess the symmetry tool but it's the one that can create like radials and i did that to get the basic design for this flower i actually looked at some of my own flower tattoos to get some of this look and then added in the leaves once everything got warped onto the arm which i just used using like the not the distort but the maybe it's warp whatever that the one all the way to the right the transform all the way to the right here we're throwing in a shark we got some little stars just for filler we've got what looks like the wick to a bomb or maybe it's a rope um then we've got a hand holding a letter so we got a lot of things here where we're slowly just sort of showing you what she's into and what she's decided to put on her body which tells you a lot about her technically um, now, one thing that I want to point out here is all of none of these tattoos were lifted from designs that exist on the internet, but I referenced designs on the internet because I am not a tattoo artist, although I consider myself an enthusiast, and so I don't know all the rules for all of these things, and I don't know all subject matter that is like really good for communicating um, maybe types of tattoos that I wouldn't even necessarily get, but I, I like and respect. So when you're looking up reference for these types of tattoos, make sure that you're trying to assimilate the qualities of them. Similar to how you would do it with an artist, you don't want to rip off a normal artist. Like when you're an illustrator, you don't want to rip off another illustrator. But when you're looking at a tattoo artist who also has all the same rules around uh, their work that, that other artists do, you don't want to lift their work entirely. You want to reference it and understand it and then try to do your own take. That said, there are certain things that you want to make sure you're hitting the reference point for. Otherwise, people are going to be like, what the fuck is that? That doesn't look anything like a tattoo that you would uh, normally get. There's a little scorpion tail going on to her ribs, kind of. Adding just a little bit of personalization here or there. Also making sure I'm leaving some errors in because not every tattoo is executed 100% perfectly. And we want to make sure that we do include a little bit of like, ooh, that's too close to that. Maybe that could have been moved over there. Um, here now is that pepper shading I was talking about. We're using that, I'm going to say, Bonobo? Bonobo? 
Bonobo, anyways, that brush, um, and we're using it on a new layer now. Eventually they'll all get merged together because we have to do a blur pass, but anyways, we'll talk about that when we get there. And what I'm doing is I'm going back again to the reference, looking at the way things are shaded, because in tattoo design, some things are shaded logically and some things are shaded for graphic reasons, not necessarily for logic reasons. And we're trying to go in and make sure that we are replicating that. When Let's talk about the blur pass. So when this is all done, what we're going to do is we're going to merge it all into the same layer, and then we are going to duplicate it, and then we're going to blur it just a little bit, and we're going to lower the opacity of both our sharp layer and our blurred layer, just so that we can try and find that right balance of a faded blurred tattoo. Every tattoo fades and blurs. The better that they're applied, they do more or less. Um, but what we want to do is we want to have some of that because we want to make sure that it looks uh, real within the context of our stylization that we've chosen for this piece. By the way, also done with symmetry where it makes sense to do symmetry. So now here we've got the duplication, the blurring, the adjusting. We're also clearing it outside of the body, all the parts where it exceeded the body. And now we're flipping on all of our other layers again to see how this all plays together. The last phase we're going to enter here, which is what you're going to watch, it's going to be kind of bonkers, is the like adjustment chaos, like me trying to figure out what the finish should be for this piece. You're going to see tons of stuff get adjusted. You're going to see bloom and shadow and a lot of just like little tweaks here and there. I'm even going into my core flats at times and adjusting certain values there because once all this lighting gets thrown on top, things like skin tones and eye colors and hair color, that all changes. So we want to make sure that we're still communicating exactly what we were going for when we originally conceived this, but now we need to also um, take into account all the layer, the lighting that's been thrown on top. So we're going through and we're adjusting every aspect of this, every little opacity, which is why it's nice to have all of this be separate because I can now make some like last minute choices that I wouldn't have been able to make if everything was kind of like merged together uh, into one big thing. So in a second here, we're gonna see that last switch over to pink, which I was trying to avoid because I know I'm the pink guy, but then I said, fuck it, let's make it pink. We add just a little bit of color balance adjustments at the very end and you get this right here. This is the final version of this piece. Personally, I'm very happy with this. I like pieces that are just like a character standing there. That's kind of why I have like a character background. I just get really enthralled with like staring into a character's eyes and trying to figure out what they're thinking. Um, I also like simplicity in general. So I just, I just like something like this. So w whether I painted this or not, this is the type of piece that I just really enjoy. Let's jump all the way back to the rough sketch. This is the rough that we use. We determined that there was enough information here to proceed to the next stage. Here's kind of like flats with a little bit of the lighting. Not everything has been adjusted. These are just snapshots I took while I was in the middle of working on it. Here, we've got some more of that lighting trying to vignette the character, and then we'll just take like a big jump all the way to what the final version of it looked like. As always, thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting like, subscribe, and sharing the video and other things on the channel. It really does help. I'll see you on the next one. And if you're looking for me on the internet, these are the places where you can find me.